staff who work for a local council have become the latest to face a crackdown over cigarette breaks. Employees at Breckland Council in Norfolk will be required to clock off while they're away from their posts. The council says it's fair, but critics described it today as tyrannical. Smokers have felt like a persecuted minority in recent years, pushed out of pubs and increasingly out of the workplace. Later this week, Breckland Council in Norfolk will vote on whether to force smokers who pop out for a cigarette at its Deerham headquarters to clock in and out, so they wouldn't have a puff during paid time. Councils across the region are taking an increasingly tough line. Staff at Basildon must make up any time spent on smoking breaks. At Waveney and Suffolk, smokers must clock in and out. And in North Norfolk, the council doesn't allow staff to smoke on site during main office hours. I mean, are they going to introduce clocking in and off for people who go on the internet, for example, onto Facebook, or people who want to have a cup of coffee? We're all entitled to a break during our working hours, in the morning and in the afternoon. And of course, I'm sure there are some smokers who abuse the situation and go out too often. But if that's happening, that's a failure of management. In Luton today, smokers didn't like the council plan. Well, no, I don't, because they take the taxes off the people to pay for the cigarettes, so I don't see why they should be penalised. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Mind you, I'm self-employed, so it wouldn't affect me. Research puts the cost of smoking breaks to UK employers at £900 million a year. Breckland says its move has nothing to do with money. It's all about being fair to staff. Richard Bond, BBC Look East. Well, let's talk to William Nunn, the leader of Breckland Council. It's all about being fair. Why are you doing it? Because you must be being unfair as well. No, I don't think this has anything to do with being unfair. As you've just heard on your own report, this is about making sure that we are fair to our staff. We have a percentage of our staff who do indeed smoke and clock out to have a cigarette in their, in their break. 54% um, in fact of our staff already clock out when going for a cigarette. What we want to do is make sure that this policy is fair for all, including those that don't smoke and don't take advantage of the breaks out of the building. We, we surveyed all of our staff, 75%, um, which is quite a high number, responded to that survey and actually said that we should get a policy through the authority which made it fair to all. We're not trying to stop smoking, we're not even trying to prevent them from smoking. What we are saying is when people go for a cigarette, they should do it in their time. This is a good way for you to save money though, isn't it? No, it's got absolutely nothing to do with money. Um, but this is just about making it fair to those individuals, really, that, that don't smoke as much as those that do smoke. Uh, I've spoken to several members of staff who feel quite, quite aggrieved that they actually can't take time off and just go for a break at the end of the day to allow them to make use of this time. So, no, this is nothing to do with money. This is about fairness to all of the staff. Director, they are gonna, you are going to dock the pay of those people who are out, so they're presumably going to have to work a, a lot more hours. Does that mean that non-smokers will go home, say, at 5 o'clock and the smokers will go home at 6? No, not at all, because at Breckland we operate a flexible time anyway, so people already clock in and out. So people already work the hours they choose when they choose, so this will just enable them to work those hours. It's just that we won't be paying them to actually go and take a cigarette. Mr Nunn, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Thank you. Well, lots more to come in Look East, including a round-up of the weekend sport. We're at the Labour Party conference. Where the BBC television presenter Fiona Bruce has appeared at the Crown Court in Basildon. Peter Oakey bombarded the newsreader with dozens of greeting cards. The photographers were waiting for Peter Oakey as he left Basildon Crown Court today. He had already admitted harassing Fiona Bruce and he was due to be sentenced for breaching a restraining order. The court heard how he sent around 20 greetings cards to Fiona Bruce. They referred to pieces of music, including Find My Love by Fairground Attraction. And they also included messages such as, I love you, Fiona, my beautiful firebird. Fiona Bruce is one of the BBC's most high-profile presenters. She fronts Antiques Roadshow, as well as reading some of the most-watched news bulletins. In a statement read to the court, she said Oki's disturbing communications had caused her great upset. She said she was worried his behaviour may escalate. The court heard how he'd also sent letters to shops, churches and a doctor's surgery in Brentwood. Oki's lawyer said Oki was adamant he was not mentally unwell and didn't need treatment. Sentencing was adjourned until next week. Gareth George, BBC Look East.
A man who attacked his neighbour with a machete at a family barbecue in Norfolk has been jailed for five years. Paul Sanderson had pleaded guilty to causing Wayne Peckham grievous bodily harm after the attack in Hillgay in July. The court heard that the incident was provoked by a dispute over garden waste. It's been confirmed that a man killed in a house fire in Clacton on Saturday was a soldier from the Royal Anglian Regiment. Kenny Pratt served with 1st Battalion. The small fire in the kitchen at Chestnut Avenue caused the house to fill with smoke and it's believed he died as a result of smoke inhalation. A statue to one of the most famous women to come out of Ipswich has been unveiled today. The Grandma statue, based on the character in the cartoons by Carl Giles, now stands on a granite slab outside the Corn Exchange. It's great to have somebody um, like Carl Giles fully recognised in Ipswich. It's not just the statue now, but it's this whole area, so really giving him the full recognition that he deserves. A rare collection of steam engines has been sold at auction for a quarter of a million pounds. The engines were part of the Thursford collection in Norfolk, but were surplus to requirements. The sale attracted interest from all over the country. At 951,000 I'm bid, 1,000 pound a bid, 1,000 I'll take you 50. At to you and me, this lot looks like a rusty old pile of junk. Not worth the time, money or effort, but to steam engine enthusiasts, it was pure gold, part of the Thursford collection in Norfolk. It's very rare to have a sale uh, with this quantity of engines in. Uh, there are nine Aveling and Porter steamrollers that have been offered for sale today. They're all in their working clothes. They're all in varying states of disrepair. It was the late George Cushing who amassed the collection. A farm labourer who became a millionaire, George couldn't help himself when it came to buying steam engines. Some have been restored, but this lot never made it, and they came from far and wide to buy. Social aspect, totally social aspect. We're seeing people from all over the country, you don't see it only perhaps once twice a year. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do on them, but there's not that many engines in this state of repair now about on the market to buy, and not only of what's been imported. And they've got no history anyway. There he then, away and sold. Thank you, sir. The top seller was a steamroller which went for £25,000. The collection sold for a total of £250,000. Not bad for a pile of rusty old metal. Mike Liggins, BBC Look East, Norfolk. Well, last week on a beach near Folkestone, David Webster from BBC Radio Norfolk stepped into the sea to swim the channel. He arrived in France later that night, exhausted but happy. And he's here now. It took you 13 hours, 15 minutes, but it didn't go smoothly, did it? It didn't go as smoothly as it could have done. After two hours, my left shoulder gave up. And then when four you hours... When you say gave up, the muscles? The muscles have all torn and all, all yeah. swollen. But then four hours from the end, it was very difficult to breathe. And it turned out I've got quite serious lung pneumonia um, through inhaling something from the channel to see what was not that clean down So there. why didn't you stop? I should have stopped. <laughs> most people, most normal people would have stopped, but I couldn't stop. I never wanted to be the person that had a go at swimming the channel, that nearly swam the channel. It was left arm over right arm until my hand touched the sand, and that's what I did. Failure wasn't an option. You know, pain is temporary. Failure just lasts forever. You were doing this to raise money for what? For the Big C, which is a cancer charity in Norfolk and Waveney. It's a cancer charity, and the reason why I did it is because my dad died of cancer a few years ago, so anything that I do, slightly mad or otherwise, that's, that's who I like to raise my money for. And you raise how much? It's, at the moment it's £2,500, but it's climbing all the while, and people brilliantly seem to be giving me £5 here, £10 there, and uh, going on to the Just Giving site, and that's still active. So it's, uh, and Dave if I asked you to go into the uh, channel again next week, you <laughs> would tell me where to go. Would I you? think I would uh, have <laughs> one or two choice words, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Thank well you. done. Now after a fantastic start, it was back to earth with a bump for our championship football teams. Here's Tom.